The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. I believe He lived and died, and that He rose again. I believe and trust in Him. Ascended into hell, Christ our living head will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe and trust in Him. I will trust in my Redeemer, seeing of His love. That lasts forever Know His hope And sure salvation I will trust in Him Though the world falls around me I rest and know That He has found me Christ the rock is my Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Creed by Richard Jensen from his album, Order of Service. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for Preaching All Salvation Through One Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus, is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Jesus. The English transliteration for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics, questions on and about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Welcome to Pastor Yeshua. In this episode, we will ask and answer several questions regarding various misconceptions about salvation. Since the concept and reality of salvation, or lack thereof, is one of eternal importance, we need to clearly understand the terms and definitions which hold authority. Historically, there is probably no greater subject for debate than the existence or non-existence of a place commonly referred to as heaven. Next to the issue of the existence of heaven, the accompanying question for debate is how does any person get into heaven? What must I do or not do in order to gain admittance? Inevitably, the various methodologies by which any person may successfully enter heaven form the basis of what is referred to as salvation. These questions and the resulting answers regarding heaven and salvation drive the engine for the creation and existence of numerous philosophical and religious belief systems throughout time. People order their lives, raise families, start businesses, spend money, and in many cases die for or against the constraints of heaven, hell, salvation, damnation, or some variation thereof. Let's pray. Father, I pray that as we open this study that you would grant that your spirit would move among us to stir us and remind us of your desire and love that we each and every one would be reconciled from death and separation to life and reconciliation. Give us strength to put aside all stubbornness, pride of heart, and any other things which stand as obstacles to receiving the truth of your word. Let your word go forward with power to give life, joy, and peace to all who will listen now and forevermore. In Jesus' name. As already stated, there have been innumerable philosophical and religious systems throughout history which ostensibly offer various paths to heaven and salvation. While at some point it would doubtlessly be of interest to address these, 
In this episode, we admittedly will make the argument primarily from the viewpoint of the Judeo-Christian biblical standpoint, rather than an argument regarding comparative religion. Instead, we recognize that regardless of the belief system, the greater overall point is that either there is a reality involving heaven and salvation, for lack of better terms, or there is not. If there is not, then all may be vanity in the end, since the only set of meaning, morals, beauty, or authority would be those assigned by the various subjective, relative dictates of the human heart and mind within our consensus, opinion, and feelings, moment to moment, person to person. On the other hand, if there is an ultimate reality where a definable heaven and salvation exists, then arguably, at least within the Judeo-Christian definition, eternity itself would be the stake with which we each gamble. Secular man, atheists and the like, begin with the assumption that there is no God. Ultimately, everything that exists, exists exclusively as a result of random chance, cause and effect, and natural occurring or reoccurring phenomena. Since God does not exist, Heaven and hell are concepts born of myth, tradition, and folklore. Since there is no God, there is no heaven, there is no hell. As a consequence, salvation is no longer a necessary commodity for anyone. In contrast, in this episode, we begin with the assumption that God exists. Second, we assume that the Bible, as presently constituted with its 66 books, is both authoritative and accurate as to who God is as well as our relationship to him. Third, we assume that heaven does exist and that salvation is necessary to escape sin, death, and separation from God in heaven. Since there is an obvious divergence of these two realities, it behooves us then to carefully study and understand the proposition in question. This is not a topic which we should be comfortable allowing others to do the thinking while we merely trust that the homework in question has been done. Neither should we allow preconception and or bias to cloud our ability to look at the subject matter. Although this episode is asking and answering questions within the Judeo-Christian biblical theological perspective, It must be noted that the Judeo-Christian is arguably a large camp depending on how one draws the lines. Over time, both the Jewish faith, which is the root, and the Christian faith, which is the branch, have been compromised to one degree or another by heretical teaching and secular thought. In some cases, the fundamental tenets are so entangled together with other humanistic elements that it is difficult to separate the two. This being true, it is crucial to bear in mind that just because an idea or belief is popular does not make the belief true. Likewise, calling oneself Christian does not automatically impute any aspects of Jesus the Christ into one's life, nor does it cause one to be Christian. The terms hell, heaven, salvation, damnation, and Christian all have particular meaning found, defined, and understood within the context of Scripture in its totality. Thus, in this case, as we discuss heaven and salvation, we will need to focus on what Scripture has to say about these questions and attempt to identify and separate those answers which are theologically sound from those answers which come from the wellspring of man's error. In essence, for anyone within the mainstream Christian faith, the goal is to obtain the promise and entry into heaven where we have eternal life and joy in the presence of our Lord and Savior, God and King, Jesus Christ. Even those who are marginally Christians by name only will likely identify with the more generic goal of going to heaven. The differences and debates begin as we begin asking how and particularly do we get to heaven? While there may be countless nuanced answers given, generally the answers given break down into predictable and reoccurring ideas. Here are the typical beliefs and answers people give to the question, quote, How do I get into heaven? Unquote. Alternately, we can also substitute the question, quote, How do I achieve salvation? Unquote. Typically, there are seven basic answers given to either question. As we identify each answer, 
let us examine what Scripture has to say regarding the merits of each. 1. The first answer to the question, How do I get into heaven, or how do I achieve salvation, is, I will get to heaven, or I will achieve salvation when, quote, My good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, unquote. The first observation to be made with the logic of this answer is that like many of the answers common to this subject is that it shows man's tendency to judge things according to a horizontal scale. That is to say, the question and answer both presume God has nothing to say about the matter and that each man is making their own eternal assessment regarding how they are doing on the path to salvation. Likewise, it leaves each person to assign their own definitions to good and bad and also to determine which of their actions, or lack thereof, fit into the categories which they have created unilaterally. If, however, we properly apply a vertical scale, then we would have to concede that it is God who is in authority and it is He alone who is ultimately defining and judging the terms and conditions in question. While man is free to agree or disagree with God, the fact remains man's opinions and feelings are irrelevant. This being the case, it behooves us to ask, what does God have to say regarding entrance into heaven being contingent on good versus bad behavior? In order to find out, we turn as always to scripture as our source of authority. Romans chapter 3 verses 10 through 12 clearly set the record straight when it says, quote, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are altogether become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one, unquote. What this and other verses remind us is that man is incapable of doing anything which God would qualify as being good on his own. While for whatever reason we may think we see what we do as being good, it doesn't matter because God is judging according to his standard and not ours. The issue boils down to man's nature. Man's essential nature is to go astray and to rebel, to seek his or her own will. We all start out and remain separated and have fallen short in our nature and character from our Creator, God. As a consequence, whenever anyone starts talking about pleasing God, achieving salvation, or going to heaven, we do so as an outsider alienated by God from, by sin. Additionally, there is no support for the idea that the status of one's salvation is conditioned on the preponderance of supposed good deeds contrasted against bad deeds. James chapter 2 verse 10 states unconditionally, quote, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all, unquote. This means that even if any person were able to conduct their lives in such a way as to keep 99.99% of every law and ordinance every day of their lives and only have one single slip-up amounting to 00.01% of their existence, they would still be guilty 100% of measuring up to God's standard. While it may give us comfort to look at our own lives and self-assign arbitrary percentage scales of ostensible goodness, God looks upon the matter from His standpoint of His eternal perfection, and in comparison to all men sees separation and unrighteousness because of our fallen state. It is also irrelevant for any person to take their perception of their individual condition and draw comparison to another person or group of persons. The classic situation is for the average person to compare themselves against someone who is by all or by most people's agreement a quote-unquote bad person. So for example we take Joe or Jane Average Citizen and compare them to, say, Adolf Hitler, 
Joseph Stalin, or the like, and as a result, we cannot help but conclude that solely according to a horizontal scale, that Joe and or Jane Citizen are quote-unquote good people. But the reality from God's standpoint is that all have fallen short of His glory. Thus, the supposed belief that you or I can find another person or persons whose behavior and deeds are obviously worse than ours in comparison means nothing to God. The reason is that God is not making a comparison to you or to me or to any other human. The only comparison God is making is each person to himself. Since God is perfect and none of us are, or were, or can be perfect by ourselves due to sin, we fail completely. In summary, when someone asks the question, quote, how do I get to heaven, unquote, or, quote, how do I achieve salvation, unquote, and they answer the question by saying something similar to, I will get to heaven, or I will achieve salvation when my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, we conclude that the truth is, with man, there are no good deeds, only sin, and the penalty for sin is death. 2. The second answer to the question, how do I get into heaven, or how do I achieve salvation, is, I will get to heaven, or I will achieve salvation when, quote, I exercise sincerity by basically being a good person, having a good heart." Unquote. Once again, the premise of this answer assumes the logic and merits of measuring terms on a horizontal scale. But as long as things are measured on a horizontal scale, we are doomed to failure, because the argument misses the reality that the measurements rightly begin and end with God and not with man. Like previously stated, using the term quote-unquote good to measure oneself to oneself according to one's own definitions has no benchmark of authority. Nor, as was pointed out, does it help anyone to compare their supposed good behaviors against another person's bad behavior. Again, the reason is that it is God who is in the end doing the comparing of each person to himself and his perfection. Given this comparison, we know according to Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, as stated earlier, that we each and all fall short of his glory. The only two concepts which have been added in an attempt to answer the question are sincerity and and having a good heart. Either term makes the erroneous assumption that there is some level of effort, work, or energy which is expended on our part which will impress or motivate God to dismiss any remaining issues on our part which displease Him. This again demonstrates man's constant nature to measure vertical issues using a horizontal scale. However, the correct perspective recognizes that in man's unregenerate state, man is incapable of either sincerity or having a good heart. For example, regarding man's heart, God asked the rhetorical question in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, quote, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Unquote. Or again, Matthew chapter 15, verse 19, quote, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witness, blasphemies, unquote. As such, in so far as sincerity is concerned, it seems apparent that sincerity is a trait linked to the character of one's heart. Therefore, sincerity is only as reliable as the quality and nature of the heart which produces it. Since the heart of man is bankrupt in its unregenerate state, the only sincerity unrepentant man possesses is the ability to be sincerely immoral, rebellious, sinful, and deluded. In summary, when someone asks the question, 
how do I get into heaven or how do I achieve salvation? And they answer the question by saying something similar to, I will get to heaven or I will achieve salvation when I exercise sincerity by basically being a good person, having a good heart. We conclude that the truth is man in his unrepentant state is sincerely separated from God by a desperately wicked, evil, and perverse nature and heart. We each and every one are forever incapable of doing good and pleasing God according to our own works and deeds. 3. The third answer to the question, how do I get into heaven, or how do I achieve salvation, is, I will get to heaven, or I will achieve salvation, quote, if I go to church on a regular basis, unquote. At its heart, this idea assumes two important things. One, first, this idea transposes focus as well as priority and dismisses the importance of causal origin. As was discussed in the episode entitled, Questions About the Church, the church is basically defined as those who are called out from the world who earnestly respond by grace through faith in Jesus. As a result, whether in a physical building identified as a church or out, it is only those who have responded by grace through faith in Jesus and who consequently have God's Spirit implanted according to an abiding relationship and new birth who meet the qualification to be Christ's church. Thus, we would have to conclude that according to God's definitions, Anyone who lacks a relationship with Jesus Christ by grace, through faith, could theoretically spend every moment from birth until death inside a building called a church and never qualify for salvation. Why? Because according to Jesus in John chapter 14 verse 6, quote, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me." Unquote. Peter also boldly makes the same case in Acts chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, saying, quote, "...be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole." This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved." Unquote. The second issue is whether or not unregenerate men have the capacity to define or understand what God would qualify as his church, or whether unregenerate man has the capacity to qualify as those who God would identify as ones called out as his followers. If, in fact, as God points out, we are all, by nature, in rebellion to our unregenerate state, then it follows that we will be unable to recognize anything of the Spirit while in an unregenerate state, since we lack God's Spirit of discernment. Consequently, while unregenerate man may sense that he is missing something, until any man is moved by God's Spirit, he will never recognize his shepherd, much less the flock who follows, or the place where they pasture. In summary, when someone asks the question, how do I get into heaven, or how do I achieve salvation? And they answer the question by saying something similar to, I will get to heaven, or I will achieve salvation, if I go to church on a regular basis. The reality is that entrance into heaven and or salvation is not contingent on going to church on a regular basis or not. Instead, salvation and or entrance into heaven is predicated on correctly knowing who Jesus is and whether or not we have an abiding relationship with him by grace through faith. 4. The fourth answer to the question, how do I get into heaven or how do I achieve salvation, is I will get to heaven 
or I will achieve salvation, quote, if I believe in God, unquote. Once again, although the answer may seem straightforward, it is in fact filled with numerous assumptions. One, the first issue which is critical to address is the proposition in the question of who, what, or how we define God. If we throw the mere word, quote-unquote, God, regardless of using a little g or a big g and attach the word belief to it, is this sufficient to qualify us for salvation? Are we home free if we attach some shallow level of belief toward a generic force in the universe which we loosely call God? Or is it important to correctly identify who God is, what our relationship to him is, as well as what constitutes belief resulting in salvation? Too often man vainly believes it is within our ability to define who and what God is as well as our relationship to him. Using these parameters, man is able to define God according to his own terms. Likewise, belief in whatever God imagined can be held at any level, however slight, to said God in question. Not surprisingly, as we continue within this train of thought, Salvation is an open book test which is self-graded by each man. In truth, God's word, the Bible, gives revelation which forces us to come to terms with the reality that there is only one true and living God. It is this God who is in authority and who makes the rules regarding not only life here, but salvation and eternity. Two. The second assumption is that having belief in God is sufficient to achieve salvation or entrance into heaven. However, according to James chapter 2, verse 19, quote, Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble, unquote. Here, this verse points out that from a scriptural standpoint, even demons, i.e. devils, hold belief in God. It should be remembered that the belief held by demons discussed here would not simply be empty, idle, or superficial belief based on assumptions. Rather, we know that they have first-hand knowledge that God exists. They are fully aware of his power and authority to the degree that they tremble. The obvious missing ingredient regarding these devils is that they have committed themselves via some act or lack thereof, which places them into a category where repentance and or forgiveness is unavailable to them. In this context, James compares the general state of man regarding mere belief in God. From this standpoint, absent special revelation, the majority of mankind has little, if any, of the first-hand experience of God's existence, power, and authority, which the devil and his demons know all too well. As a result, we realize that the belief held by demons or devils is experiential, whereas the belief held by humans is mostly, if not all, academic. In summary, when someone asks the question, how do I get into heaven, or how do I achieve salvation, and they answer the question by saying something similar to, I will get to heaven, or I will achieve salvation, if I believe in God, The determining factor is not simply belief, but rather specific action. Paraphrased, James is saying that having belief in God is good, but it is no better than the demons without faith. In terms of establishing reconciliation and a saving relationship with God, generic belief by itself is insufficient. The demons and the devils have belief in God so much so that they tremble. Instead, belief must grow to blossom into confidence, and confidence must lead to daily action which is supported by belief and confidence. It is only when an action is present based upon belief, supported by confidence in the all-sufficiency of Jesus and His saving grace, that faith is now alive. It is through this same grace, through faith in Jesus, that we are assured of salvation. This concludes part one of this episode. 
Please join me for the conclusion, part two, of Questions About Salvation. Thank you for listening. Trust me.